my name's Lewis. I graduated from UCLA uh, pre-pandemic uh, with a PhD in mechanical engineering, and now I work at the NASA Jet Propulsion Laboratory. Uh, during the day, I work to find signs of past life on Mars, uh, but on my nights and weekends, I run a nonprofit called Student Mojo, which provides housing, food, and community to college students who don't have a place to call home. Um, and it's run entirely by college students. So the numbers on college hunger and homelessness are only recently being studied, uh, but the full dimensions of it are starting to come into view. So I went to UCLA. 5% of all UC students reported experiencing homelessness, 10% of all Cal State students, and nearly one in five community college students in LA are experiencing homelessness. So if you look at your table, that's about, that's if two people at your table didn't know where they were gonna eat next or where they were gonna sleep tonight. And I often get the question, you know, who are homeless students exactly? These students are caught in a perfect storm of two massive forces. One is the lack of affordable housing, and the second is the lack of affordable education. Um, and this isn't to mention a third equally powerful force of the deeply personal. So if you came from the foster care system and it didn't treat you so well, uh, if you have family strife or conflict or tragedy, undocumented legal status, uh, you're disowned because of your gender, or you live in poverty, or a combination of all of the above are often why students end up without a place to call them. So if you'll indulge me, I'd like to recruit you all, you know, past this lunch as, as mythbusters. Um, so one of the myths is, I paid my way through college, they can too. So who here worked through college? Raise your hand. I did, it was great, it worked decently well. Uh, if you attended college in the 70s, national average tuition for a four-year public university cost about $3,000, a minimum wage job paid about three bucks an hour. That equates to about roughly four hours a day throughout the year to fully pay your way. Fast forward to now, tuition is 10 times more expensive. The minimum wage is not 10 times. Um, some of you already may know this sticker shock firsthand as parents of college age students. Um, and in California, where the minimum wage is 16 an hour, you'd have to work eight hours a day. Or if you live in a state where the federal minimum wage is 725 and hasn't changed in more than 10 years, up to 15 hours a day. Okay, who here knows what the FAFSA is? For those not in the know, you guys are lucky, it's a gigantic form, 700 pages that you need to fill out for financial aid. Uh, Tolstoy's worst work. Uh, the, the myth here is students in need are covered by financial aid. And often it works well. Pell grants get to, to students in need often. Uh, but sometimes it doesn't work well. So I'll just give you one example. There's one field in the FAFSA called the expected family contribution. How much money can your family contribute to your education? But what's tragic about that seemingly innocent question is that it makes some rather grand assumptions of you as a person. First, it assumes that money flows from parent to child. For a lot of students, sometimes money flows in the opposite direction. Money flows from child to parent to keep the family afloat. Second, it assumes that you and your parents are on good terms. This is not true if your family is dysfunctional or abusive which is the case for many LGBTQ students. And finally, it, ass it assumes that you have parents at all. And this is often not the case for former foster youth, who sometimes get dropped like a rock once they turn 18 and the checks from the state stop coming. So this is one representative tragic example of a system that isn't built with these students in mind. And so they fall through the cracks. And so this is the promise of today's college that tells students we'll take care of them, but often leaves, leaves them shortchanged. And more recently in 2020, when the pandemic hit, 3 million students dropped out of college that year. Uh, if you remember, the first jobs to get axed were the service and the retail uh, jobs, part-time student workers. Um, and so they dropped out when they lost their paycheck because they still had rent to pay. Um, and they dropped out often for a financial crisis of less than $500.
you know, college is incredibly high stakes these days because they get stuck with no diploma, but all of the debt. But my classmates and I at UCLA observed this in person firsthand. We found some of our peers were sleeping in spaces that weren't meant for sleeping. Classrooms, uh, lounges, cars, not to mention doubled up in couch surfing and unsafe spaces. So we kept this in the dresser of our minds so we couldn't any longer. So we started our first space called Ruin Shelter because it was going to be run entirely by UCLA students for free to give our fellow students a safe place to sleep and food to eat. So every night, UCLA undergrads would open the doors, cook dinner. A couple of them would stay overnight as RAs to make sure everyone was safe. Uh, MSW and medical students provided access to social and health services. It wasn't rocket science. Um, most importantly, college students from any institution could stay with us because we felt intimately the, thousand of, the thousands of opportunities across a lifetime that are at stake between getting a diploma and getting your dream job or falling just shy. And it turns out there are hundreds of homeless college students at colleges and universities across the country, including at USC, which inspired USC students to start Trojan Shelter a few years later. One of the founding members is sitting right here, Matt Lee. Uh, yeah, I give them. UC Davis students, UC Santa Cruz students, UC Berkeley students starting theirs as well. So now it's, it's a bona fide student movement of students who care so deeply about education and housing that they create it on their own and they run it on their own. So this is a story that really can't be told by just me. So with their permission, I'd like to share a couple of the experiences of, of our residents. So one of our residents, uh, she was living in her car when I met her. She was kicked out by an abusive partner. And in the DV cases, it's nearly always the woman who bears the fallout. Um, and so she was kicked out of the apartment. Uh, she was working on her final paper, 3,000 words minimum. She had written about 1,000 words, which was more than the number of calories that she had consumed for the past 24 hours. Um, and so she wrote, my name is Alexa, and this is what my classmates will never know about me. I have a conflicted family life. I never really knew my mom, except that she didn't know her mom either. I dove into school so that I could build a good life with my own two hands. When I graduate, I want to be a cancer officer. Another resident wrote, I'm Marion. I'm a transfer student from Long Beach. My two siblings and I are survivors of domestic abuse. And to protect ourselves, we fled from our home. I want to become an orthopedic surgeon when I finish school, and I'll do anything to get my education. Then there's, there's me. Lewis, a mechanical engineer and son of immigrants who had me here so that I could have opportunities that they didn't. Uh, and when I was trying to start our first shelter, I had asked UCLA for space on campus, and they gave me an immediate no. So I went out to Westwood and Santa Monica, uh, knocked on 50 church and temple doors, asking if they would be the site for our shelter, um, and got 50 no's. But on the 51st, I got a yes. And you only need one yes. You don't need 50 yeses. Uh, and because we're run entirely by volunteers, our budget was about $50,000, shoestring budget for running a shelter. Uh, but no one wanted to fund it because having 18 to 21 year olds run a shelter wasn't a formula that people would develop. And for that reason, I decided to live in my car for two years and use the money that I would otherwise need for rent as the only way we could fund the shelter at the time. Eight years later, more than 300 students are operating their own shelters in three different cities at various faith based organizations, and they're running it incredibly successfully. Because if we start from the assumption that the shelter must happen, if we start there that we're not leaving talent on the table of a cancer researcher who could make a world-changing discovery or a surgeon who could save a life, yours or mine, the math just makes sense. You know, one person forfeits their housing so that 50 others can have it, like Alexa and Mary. So it's the last one. I want to zoom out a little bit because one special part are the students that we're helping, but the other part that equally energizes me are the students who are doing the helping. 
So just real quick, who here can say what SNCC from the Civil Rights Movement stands for? Just yell it out loud. A plus. And that's right, it's it's the first letter, students. Students who led the sit-ins. Students like a young John Lewis making good trouble. Without students, the civil rights movement does not happen the way it happens. You go to the students organizing anti-war protests during Vietnam, to now, to gun safety, to climate justice and protecting our environment. Students have shown throughout history they know how to drive change. They have a vision for a society that's kinder, fairer, and wiser. And it's because of this fact that I have a profound appreciation for students and the power they possess to shape the world that we live in. So our plan for 2024 is to open a couple more houses in LA. I'm inviting anyone who feels called to our cause to come and talk to me or write to me, get involved in any way that you want to take part. Um, so I just want to end by how I started, by saying thank you. Thank you for listening to our story, for believing in the power of students. You know, everyone here has immense talent, whether you're running programs at City Hall or raising money for community orgs, uh, or you're a good storyteller and, and a connector of worlds. We're grateful for any way that you want to be involved. And I know as Rotarians, with all the scholarship programs that you run, uh, it's pretty self-evident that you believe in the power of the diploma. And like Nancy said in her speech, it's simply one of my philosophies in life to remind the people that they're good. Thank you. Thank you very much.